Okay, welcome back everybody. I hope you got a chance over the break to uh, visit the uh, virtual exhibit hall, maybe catch up, uh, catch a few of those tech talks. Uh, as I've been mentioning uh, throughout the whole symposium here, uh, we are giving away an iPad uh, every day for, uh, for those folks uh, that uh, can uh, qualify to enter the drawing, the uh, raffle by uh, interacting with every booth in the exhibit hall. And I'm, I'm happy to say we've got our uh, first winner from yesterday. So uh, Matthew LaCrosse from Marion County's Sheriff's Office will be sending you your iPad to the address you've got registered in the system. Thank you so much for supporting the, uh, our sponsors and exhibitors. And for the rest of the audience today, uh, please uh, make sure you have a chance to go take that tour, get yourself uh, qualified for that drawing and we will uh, hopefully have another winner's name to announce uh, yesterday. Had four folks make the bar today, so uh, make sure you leave yourself some time to get out there and uh, visit all those booths. So thank you very much for that. Okay, as I mentioned uh, before the break, this afternoon we are happy to bring you a uh, high-powered uh, two-four from our nation's newest service. Uh, joining us today, Lieutenant General John J.T. Thompson, Commander of Space and Missile Systems Center at uh, LA Air Force Base, and he's also the Air Force uh, Program Executive Officer for Space. And in those roles, he manages the research, design, development, acquisition, and sustainment of satellites in the associated command and control systems. And joining him today, we've got uh, Lieutenant General Stephen Whiting, Commander of Space Operations Command uh, here at Peterson Air Force Base, one of the field commands for Space Force. And in those roles, he leads the preparation, generation, and sustainment of combat-ready intelligence, cyber, space, and combat support forces. So as I mentioned earlier, well qualified to give us the space perspective on convergence and tell us a little bit about what's going on in their AORs. Uh, I'll let you click into the details of their biographies. I'm sure uh, you can... Uh, you can uh, see that they both got very long and qualified careers, and we're happy to have them both with here, here with us today. So I don't want to take any more of their time. So, Generals, uh, over to you, and I look forward to hearing what you have to say today. Hey, well, thanks so much, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, truly great to be here with you all, and uh, specifically to be joined by my good friend, Lieutenant General J.T. Thompson, our Space Force Senior Acquirer, and one of the critical national leaders in ensuring we have the tools to ensure U.S. space superiority. Of course, I wish we were able to do this uh, conference in person, but under the current conditions, I'm glad we can transition to this virtual platform. Now, traditionally during these types of conferences, you have a, a keynote speech, but with the changing environment using virtual platforms, it allows us to change it up a bit today. And so as noted, you get two keynoters in tandem and a special thanks to JT and his team who reached out to us to see if we would be open to highlighting the synergy between space operations and space acquisitions especially as it relates to the cyber arena. The teams we have the privilege to lead have been acquiring and operating space capabilities for the Joint Force for decades, and we will continue to do so for years to come as two of the three field commands of U.S. Space Force and on behalf of United States Space Command and other combatant commands we support. Now with the Space Force having been established only 15 months ago and U.S. Space Command preceding it by an additional four months, the nation, the joint force, our interagency teammates, our allies, and strategic competitors are looking to see what is different and what is new uh, about the path we are on. And I'm happy to say that although there is still a tremendous amount of work for us to do, we're on an accelerating upward trajectory. Now, these changes are important for a number of reasons, not least of which is that it lets those who may wish to disrupt our freedom of action in space and cyber know that we have a dedicated force of men and women motivated to protect and defend America and our allies in those domains. And to put a finer point on it, we now have a cadre of Space Force guardians whose career long focus will be to develop, acquire, and operate combat ready, intel led, cyber secure space and combat support forces. And our focus today will be on how we mature our ability to provide cyber secure capabilities and leverage the cyber domain to extend the reach of our space capabilities. Now I'd like to turn it over to my teammate and fellow field commander, JT. Hey, uh, thanks very much, Stephen. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, I, like Stephen, uh, to all of our audience members, would just like to shout out to y'all how much uh, I would like to be there in person and maybe be standing right beside Stephen on stage uh, uh, somewhere in uh, the Colorado Springs area. Uh, but because of the pandemic, I'm greeting you from uh, uh, sunny uh, Southern California, El Segundo, California today. 
Uh, a special thanks to Rich, Phil, and Vanessa for uh, setting up this whole event. Uh, and thanks to all of you for uh, participating today. It's really fantastic to be here with my good friend and counterpart, uh, Stephen Whiting. Uh, uh, Stephen gave a shout out to us at the beginning of his remarks about this was our idea. Uh, but I have to tell you, um, uh, as soon as we suggested it, our uh, teammates in the Space Operations Command from Stephen on down uh, embraced it as an awesome way for us uh, as a service uh, to talk to you all today about some things that are really important uh, to the United States Space Force and really important uh, to uh, all of you as well. Um, in our shared leadership space of satellites, radars, and ground control stations, both Stephen and I uh, have a massive amount of data uh, compromised of numerous data types going across our networks every day. So developing the tools and systems that allow our cyber defenders to effectively monitor the network is a major challenge and requires really extreme close coordination uh, between the triad of systems developers, uh, like you'll find at uh, Space and Missile Systems Center, uh, and cyber operators and space operators, like you'll find in the Space Operations Command. We've all seen how cyber attacks have impacted both the commercial and government sectors over the last uh, decade or so. Uh, whether you're talking in terms of exfiltrated intellectual property, uh, compromised supply chains, or the development of offensive cyber capabilities by our adversaries, those countries have been continuing to refine and advance their cyber toolkits against us. We've seen a few high profile incidents over, um, unfold here over the last few months. Um, in early February, an attacker gained illicit access to the control system of a water treatment facility in Oldsmar, Florida. Once inside the system, the attacker raised the levels of sodium hydroxide being pumped into the water to toxic levels. Now, thankfully, this attack was quickly noticed and reversed before any, anyone was harmed, but it is really sobering to me, and I know many of you, um, about the need for us to continually remind ourselves that securing our infrastructure control systems is really important. Last December, FireEye and Microsoft broke the news of the solar winds attack and the sunburst malware that infected literally tens of thousands of systems in both government and commercial organizations around the world. That use of the Orion software updates as an attack vector was incredibly powerful and took the concept of supply chain based attacks to a whole new level. As we harden the cybersecurity baselines of our space systems, it's really imperative that we account for the entire program lifecycle, from ensuring the trustworthiness of component and subcomponent suppliers, all the way through ensuring operational defense once the systems are transitioned to our space warfighters. To meet that ever increasing challenge to ensure cybersecurity, we're pursuing a number of efforts to address both our field systems and our systems currently in, de in development. It's important to distinguish between these really two different types of systems. With our fielded systems, we really often find ourselves in a bolted on situation where the system might not have been originally designed with strong enough cybersecurity measures, especially as the threat environment has evolved. With our newer systems, we're focused on working with our developers and partners in industry to ensure that strong cyber protections are baked in from the beginning. And we have a number of initiatives underway to tackle both of these scenarios, which I'll mention later. Cybersecurity continues to be one of our most pressing challenges for organizations in both operations and acquisitions. And I'm really looking forward to this discussion about the work being done on both sides of the Space Force House to tackle these great challenges. Stephen, back to you. Hey, thanks, JT. Uh, as you noted, uh, you know, the work we're doing in both operations and acquisitions is critical. So I think it'd be appropriate for me at this point to give you all an understanding of where we are today in cyber with Space Force and Space Operations Command uh, or SPOC as we like to call our field command. Now in the very infancy of our new service, the Chief of Space Operations, who's JT's and my boss, General Jay Raymond, directed and challenged us to develop a light, lean, agile and lethal force. Our goal was to develop a force with a laser focus on what our Space Force Capstone Doctrine document calls, all, calls our three cornerstone responsibilities. And if you haven't had a chance to see this document, 
I would really encourage you to Google it. It's well worth reading to understand how we view space power and the role of guardians in that. But it highlights our three cornerstone responsibilities being preserving freedom of action in space, enabling joint lethality and effectiveness, and providing independent options for the nation. Now, cyber operations are vital to all three of those cornerstone responsibilities. The US Space Force operates truly global networks which connect every location on the globe, including fixed command and control facilities, mobile ground forces on the move, and air and maritime forces operating from the high Arctic all the way through the equatorial regions. And all of that is linked by satellites orbiting up to altitudes of 22,000 miles above the Earth's surface in geosynchronous orbit. And while near peers have certainly shown that they are investing in and fielding counter space capabilities to attack our satellites on orbit, they also are heavily investing in cyber capabilities to deny us access to these global space networks. Just look, in addition to the examples JT highlighted, to the recent cyber intrusions across the US government or the exfiltration of the Office of Personnel Management Security Clearance Database several years ago. In both cases, adversaries exploited our relatively unsophisticated cybersecurity TTPs, and we have to be more vigilant. Now, for countries like Iran and North Korea that can't yet take us on in the space domain, the low cost of entry to develop cyber capabilities to seek to deny our global space networks gives them an opportunity we must take seriously. So for all of these reasons, we have stood up a dedicated space delta within SPOC to concentrate directly on defensive cyber operations and serve as the seed corn for maturing our cyber capabilities going forward. Space Delta-6, or Delta-6, or Del-6, as the cool kids say, is focused on building defensive cyber capabilities across all of our mission sets. It is at the Delta level where we see the importance of having the right capability and systems at the right time to support mission execution. The essence that we must have to achieve space superiority. And I know that's something JT is extremely familiar with as well. Hey, uh, thanks, uh, Stephen, very well said. Um, with respect to cybersecurity for our acquisition programs, we're focused on working with our developers and partners in industry to ensure the security of our development environments and include stronger and clearer cybersecurity requirements in our contracts. Over just the past decade, gigabytes of DOD data have been exfiltrated by our adversaries. And we've seen that the current regulatory framework, policies, and cybersecurity measures have really been insufficient to combat this threat. At SMC, we're participating in a series of initiatives to defend against exfiltration. Measures include review of legacy contracts, increased penetration testing, and the creation of an SMC Cyber Assistance and Assessment Team, or the CAT. The CAT is a team of SMC and FFRDC cybersecurity experts who partner with small and mid-sized businesses in our supply chain to help them increase the security of their company networks. This support will include functions like monitoring the network for anomalous activity, as well as performing robust scanning and analysis to detect flaws and vulnerable miscommunications in the network. The, an additional benefit of that partnership with the CAT is assistance with CMMC, C, uh, Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification Compliance, by helping them map NIST 800-171 controls to open findings. We just started our very first CAT engagement with one of our vendors only two weeks ago, and I'm really excited to see how this new form of symbiotic military commercial cybersecurity partnership gets going. On the contracting front, we've completed an in-depth review of the cybersecurity language in our legacy contracts and are working with our system developers to include updated cybersecurity clauses that more clearly define the contractor's responsibilities with regard to protecting the critical developmental data of our programs. These are just two initiatives we have underway to secure our development networks and protect our program data. And we're committed to getting this critical issue right. Back to you, Stephen. Hey, thanks, JT. I really appreciate hearing about those critical SMC initiatives to protect our systems and data. And it's probably a good segue into how our guardians will operate the capabilities acquired by your team to protect and defend space capabilities. 
Now, I often refer to cyber as our soft underbelly. And one of the many, and one of my key areas of focus during my tenure as a SPOC commander will be to further develop our cyber enterprise. Now, the priorities of, of our cyber uh, operations within SPOC will be to first, mature and expand Delta Six's mission defense teams in tight partnership with the mission space deltas. Now, let me take a moment to explain what a mission defense team or MDT is. Now, you probably all heard of cyber protection teams or CPTs, which are dedicated teams of cyber and intel professionals who can quickly maneuver onto almost any cyber terrain to rapidly assess that terrain for cyber vulnerabilities. They also hunt for and remove persistent threat actors who might be operating on that terrain. Now, that's a critical capability, but equally critical are MDTs, dedicated teams of cyber and intelligence professionals who persistently defend the same cyber terrain each and every day. So for example, Delta 6's 62nd Cyber Squadron at Buckley provides an MDT for Delta 4's space-based infrared system or SIVRS weapon system. Now to put it mildly, the cyber guardians of the 62nd know the SIVRS weapon system as well as the guardians of the second space warning squadron who operates SIVRS at Buckley. The SIVRS MDT operates on the SIVRS networks 24 seven 365 to watch that cyber terrain, to become familiar with its pattern of life and to identify anomalies, vulnerabilities and threats and remediate them. Now at an enterprise level, the Cyber Defense Correlation Cell for Space or CDCC will serve as the guiding organization over our MDTs, providing defense in depth and enabling resiliency across multiple mission systems. Today, the CDCC supports a number of MDTs across SIBRS, the AEHF SATCOM program, the Satellite Control Network, and GPS. But we will expand that in the coming years to support other MDTs in our enterprise. The CDCC will in turn stay connected with other Space Force cyber entities like the Field Command Communication Control Center, which is located at Vandenberg, and provides situational awareness on NIPR and SIPR network uptime for the CSO, they also track cybersecurity orders to ensure our administrative networks are secure across 14 sites, nine cyber commanders, and 16,000 users supporting our mission. Now, after we mature and expand our MDTs, our second priority will be to build a cyber protection team capability. Having a highly trained defensive cyber maneuver force will allow both Space Force and US Space Command to rapidly respond to emerging threats and needs. And finally, after we've built out our MDTs and CPTs, we see a future in which Space Force Cyber Guardians also contribute to the offensive cyber operations mission in partnership with the Air Force. Now, just like all the other military services have defensive and offensive cyber capabilities, we think the Space Force should also have DCO and OCO capabilities to support the Joint Force. And who better? to think about how to use the cyber domain to extend the reach of space capabilities than Space Force Cyber Guardians who will spend their entire career at that nexus between space and cyber. Now to get after our other Spock cyber priorities, we will have to make some very deliberate decisions. And let's not kid ourselves about the need to compete well within the department's resource allocation processes. The nation and the joint force are counting on us to improve our Space Force capabilities, including cyber defenses, and we are going to have to make some tough decisions in upcoming budgets, recognizing that lots of areas will be competing for additional resources. A critical part of our cyber vision and plan will be to realign cyber defense forces, some of which currently reside in our other space mission deltas under Dell 6 in order to concentrate and focus a critical mass of expertise and oversight. And I'm really proud of all of our Delta, Garrison and Wing leadership teams as they have already pitched in to assist Dell 6 with the, the building out this vision and the trust and interconnectedness they are showing will allow us to advance our cyber priorities. But not gonna kid ourselves, this is not going to be an easy task and we still have a lot of work to do to flesh out this plan, but I have full confidence in our cyber guardians. But I also know it's not just in Spock that bold new ideas are being fostered. Uh, JT and his team have also been improving the relationship between acquirers and engineers and our operators to ensure we have the right capabilities at the right time. JT, back to you. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. So uh, maybe for everybody, just a little uh, uh, details on the cyber work 
that the acquirers are doing with operators and some of our key partnerships. Uh, the SMC Defensive Cyber Ops for Space or DCOS um, uh, team is tightly coupled with the MDTs and the CDCC that uh, Stephen mentioned earlier. These DCOS developers are working closely with the cyber operators to develop tools and capabilities that provide real-time awareness of what's going on inside the network of our satellite ground systems. They utilize a DevSecOps process to rapidly iterate updates and incorporate new features on real-time operator feedback. By the way, this is one area where we've made tremendous progress tearing down the walls between operators and acquirers working together to develop the tools and tactics at the same time to ensure maximum effectiveness and operational relevance. This effort has a great track record of developing actual defensive capabilities for operators. So it's not just vaporware living inside some flashy PowerPoint slide or an updated version of the risk management framework. However, this type of approach really requires new types of investments and resources as Stephen alluded to earlier both in terms of specific software and hardware capabilities, as well as the training and development of knowledgeable acquirers and developers who can make informed decisions and speak the same language as the defensive cyber operators. Traditionally, cyber hasn't been a high priority and therefore resourced as other systems attributes have been. So we're taking a hard look at how to close this gap and increase this investment in space specific cyber capabilities. It's hard to justify in our POM process, but Stephen and I are both committed to working at that harder to make sure that our defensive cyber operations for space, our MDTs, our DCCSs are all getting what they need to do their job. Cyber has often been a contentious point between what the operational security folks want and what the acquisition folks actually deliver. So I've been really impressed to see how closely these teams from ops and acquisition have synchronized to rapidly build secure networks and systems. In fact, our teams have spent so much time working together with each other that I'm pretty sure Steven thinks my cyber team works for him and they do. Request to industry though, just for everybody who's listening in. One of the things that we need to get better at is designing our systems with the right hooks in them from the beginning. So our cyber defenders can pull things like log files or perform traffic and packet analysis and build an accurate picture of how our systems are behaving so that they can detect anonymous or malicious activity. Right now, we're still at that bolted on phase that I mentioned earlier, where my cyber developers are having to engineer the right sorts of network taps to collect the data necessary for the security teams on our legacy systems. As we build out our new systems, we need to make sure the cyber operator is included right alongside the space operator as an end user of the system and that their data needs are taken 100% into account. Back to you, Stephen. Hey, thanks, JT. And, and with those SMC initiatives you just highlighted, it comes down to collaboration, which is a bedrock for Spock and especially for Delta-6, who will be building synergy throughout the Space Force, Spock and other government agencies and industry partners. Starting from within, we are already building interdependency to improve our cyber defense capabilities. Now, Space Delta 7 is our ISR Delta, and they are already a key partner with Delta 6, as together they are developing a combined approach to providing our cyber guardians and mission owners with cyber intel that is actionable and relevant. There will also need to be collaboration with the supported mission deltas to provide space mission expertise and knowledge that will link cyber effects to space capabilities. And I've already spoken about how powerful this can be using the Cibers MDT as an example at Buckley. Then of course, we have our relationship with SMC or soon to be Space Systems Command to develop and field the tools and systems necessary to support cyber ops as JT has mentioned. And let me assure you, uh, those listening, JT and others that our cyber guardians are thrilled with the capabilities that SMC's DCO for Space Program Office is delivering. As JT noted, this is truly a DevSec, DevSecOps approach in which our Dell 6 cyber guardians are tightly linked with JT cyber developers and acquirers to deliver rapidly improving generations of enhanced cyber defense capabilities. 
Now, from an external perspective, it's important to build a network of teams with other organizations who are also focused on cyber, many of whom have already blazed the trail that we are trying to now walk. For example, we plan to partner with Air Force cyber organizations like AFCyber and the 616th Operations Center to rapidly mature and advance existing capabilities. There is obviously no need for us to start from ground zero. We can start with benchmark practices and processes from these outstanding organizations and others like NSA, U.S. Space Command, and U.S. Cyber Command. JT, back over to you. Thanks, Stephen. Hey, just a couple of uh, cyber initiatives that I'd really like to talk to the uh, to the audience about. Um, uh, one of our biggest cyber security assessment challenges that we're facing is testing onboard computer systems running our space vehicles. Uh, there are really unique protocols, architectures, software, and hardware. Um, and frankly, there's not a lot of room to recover if you run a pen test against a satellite that's already on orbit and it blue screens the spacecraft. The ability to safely and effectively test and enhance um, a space vehicle security is a necessary capability that our cyber operators and developers need to have. To enable this kind of testing, we're developing the Satellite Penetration Environment and Evaluation Demonstration, or SPEED system, to provide cybersecurity testers a representative network that simulates spacecraft internal communications and protocols. SPEED will give us enhanced insights into the trustworthiness of our internal communications and allow us to test new protective measures on representative system architectures. Another effort that we've been using to test the security of our space systems is the Hackasat series of events. At last year's DEF CON conference, SMC, along with SPOC and partners in AFRL, Defense Digital Service, and over 55 other government and FFRDC organizations, ran the very first space-focused hacking challenge. Out of the original field of 2,000 teams, eight finalist teams competed to solve a series of cybersecurity challenges and ultimately get a chance to command an actual on-orbit satellite to take a picture of the moon. So it was really an actual moonshot. We learned a ton of valuable lessons and our cyber operators were able to take observations from the event and turn them into actual defensive measures on live systems. Continuing this type of innovative partnership between the Space Force, other government partners, and the broad civilian cyber community is going to be a key to involving or solving, I'm sorry, the wicked cybersecurity challenges facing us in the space domain. The team is hard at work on the plan for this year's Hackasat event, so be on the lookout for more details. All right, JT, well, thank you to you and your team for the uh, teamwork on those initiatives. Uh, our Space Force guardians who are focused on cyber are our first line of defense. And in the near term, we must posture them to defensively guard against adversary threats to our space assets. However, as we all know, cyber is constantly evolving and we are pivoting our cyber guardians from building and operating base level IT networks to defending those networks against hostile action to potentially developing offensive cap capabilities, which will further our space superiority and joint force integration efforts. Now it's beyond the scope of the discussion today but for this vision to come to fruition, we must have the Enterprise IT as a Service Initiative come to closure. Simply said, it is absolutely vital that ITAS succeeds and we in the US Space Force are dedicated to doing all we must to ensure that happens. Now being able to join uh, Lieutenant General Thompson in discussing the importance of cyber is exactly what we need to ensure our operators and acquirers are in lockstep as we continue to develop our Space Force. Thank you again, and I look forward to the Q&A portion of the uh, afternoon. Semper Supra, and back to you, JT. Hey, uh, thanks, Stephen. Uh, fantastic discussion today. Uh, thanks for everyone in the audience for joining us and really looking forward to those questions. Uh, getting cyber right is an absolute necessity for our systems, both in development and in the field. And the work that Stephen and his teams uh, are doing is truly groundbreaking. I'm really, in fact, proud of the relationship we've built uh, between operations and acquisition communities. Um, before we get to the q and I just, um, I, I, it, in terms of just emphasizing the partnership between acquisition and acquirers, and acquirers uh, 
you know, there's a phenomena that can occur in the vacuum of space. It's called cold welding. Uh, this happens when two pieces of similar metal make contact and without the normal interference of gas and dust present on earth, the electrons can freely flow between the two pieces of metal and form a solid bond. Uh, there's such little interference between the two sides that the electrons don't realize that they're supposed to be separate. This is the level of synchronization and cross-flowing support we're working towards between acquisition cyber expertise and operations cyber expertise. Uh, really looking forward to continuing to work that with Steven and his team. Really looking forward to hearing your questions. Semper Supra. Yes, General, thank you so much for um, your insight into, you know, what Cyber Guardians are going to be doing here in the future. Um, the first question that we have from the audience is, what is Space Force's plan to attract and retain Cyber Guardians? Sure, I'll be happy to start on that and then uh, pitch it over to, to General Thompson. Uh, you know, the Space Force uh, is at a unique scale. Uh, given our size, and that gives us a lot of opportunities. Um, I think compared to the U.S. Air Force, which assesses somewhere, I think, around 40 to 45,000 enlisted and officers uh, a year, we're going to assess uh, under 1,000. And so we can really think about a headhunting model here where we go out and, and seek out the best talent in the United States uh, for both uh, critical enlisted positions and officer positions, and then give them uh, meaningful work, exciting work, being involved in U.S. Space Force helping to protect and defend our space capabilities and protect American interests on orbit. And then we think the vision that we've laid out with the tools that JT and his team are, are bringing to us, that constitutes a really exciting career for a cyber guardian who can, who can grow up and, and maybe one day we can think about a U.S. Cyber Command commander who, who, who has, he or she has walked that path in, in U.S. Space Force. So, uh, so I think we have a, a real uh, opportunity given our scale, but we'd love to hear JT's thoughts on that. Yeah, I uh, absolutely uh, agree with Stephen. From a talent management perspective, the concept of headhunting is just really a game changer for us. Um, plus the fact that uh, the Space Operations Command, uh, the eventual Space Systems Command, the eventual um, uh, STARCOM Space Training and Readiness Command, the three field comms uh, of the U.S. Space Force, um, are being designed to be as flat, lean, and agile as possible. So it really gives um, uh, cybersecurity experts, cyber operators, and everybody else the opportunity to do hands-on the way that it's much more, in a way that uh, maybe a much, much larger service wouldn't have the opportunity to do as much hands-on. It's uh, essentially going to be, as Stephen alluded to, an elite, small uh, fighting force um, uh, with uh, uh, very specialized capabilities and, and being able to establish that and use that as a recruiting tool to get who you want into the service, I think is a really powerful combination. Yes, thank you both for your insight on that. Um, so, so the next question we have is, is really, you mentioned ITAS as, you know, pretty pretty predominant in, in how we move forward from a cyber perspective. So, so knowing that funding is, is an issue as it relates to, you know, the phases and the waves of, of the Air Force and Space Force rolling out ITAS, you know, and moving to, to meet customer requirements and modernize the, the networks um, to ensure space dominance, you know, what, what do we have to do? What is, um, what does that look like going forward from a, from a funding and a strategy perspective, from a Space Force perspective? Yeah, so I'll go first on this one. I, I, I think that um, the value proposition is the most important aspect of any ITAS or any other, you know, uh, uh, cybersecurity uh, concept. How, are you getting the bang for the buck? Um, I think that the way that the Department of Defense uh, does their planning and programming uh, sometimes um, thinks about the, if it's a football team, they, they're thinking about the quarterback and the wide receivers and the running backs. Um, and um, I think a lot of the stuff uh, that's incorporated in uh, IT as a service 
or in the basic elements of cybersecurity is more like blocking and tackling, right? Um, and so the value proposition has got to be a, we can't, we can't pay a king's ransom uh, for the services that we need, but boy, we need effective services that can help us deliver uh, the cybersecurity effects uh, that we want on our fielded weapon systems and the capabilities that our MDTs and uh, cyber operators really need in the field. Stephen? Yeah, thanks, JT. And I'll just build on your comments. And I, I totally agree with what you just passed on. But, you know, the Air Force has this incredibly rich legacy with communications and the communications and cyber career fields. And historically, those have been uh, focused on probably two areas. One is uh, building out base level IT. And that's a critical capability that the Air Force can't walk away from because they have to think about going to austere airfields and setting up those communications in a, in a place that might not have any communications. And then the other part, historically, the Air Force has worked is what you might call mission communications, but those communications that enable specific uh, aerial missions or space missions, uh, both, both are critical. But if we are going to pivot a workforce to now defend mission systems in the cyber domain, we've got to somehow free them up. And it's really in that base level IT here at our main operating bases that we have to focus that. And of course, that's what ITAS is trying to do. And there's a very hardworking and dedicated and intelligent program office that's working this. Um, and, and JT highlighted the, uh, the issues with resources. We want to be full partners with the Air Force and with that program office and looking at new and innovative ways. Because ITAS was really formulated five years ago or six years ago, and technology is changing so rapidly. There, there may be ways, as JT highlighted, to do it uh, cheaper than we thought and still get better capability. And we just have to be a full partner with that, despite the ongoing challenges of bringing it to closure. Yes, sir, thank you for that. Um, next question. Uh, can you speak to um, your thoughts on the expansion of guard and reserve units to complement Space Force mission and maybe some of the potential challenges you see with that going forward? Hey, JT, if you like, I'll start with this one. Uh, but first, we are so utterly reliant on our total force teammates. We just have spectacular professionals in the, the Air Force Reserve and the Air National Guard. Uh, and, and we will remain reliant on them in United States Space Force. Uh, there's work ongoing to figure out exactly what those two components will, uh, will look like. Uh, in a Space Force future, uh, and however that lands, and, and that will require a literal act of Congress, we will remain dependent on uh, those reservists and guardsmen. Um, you know, they're already doing great work for us in, uh, in the space domain. We're growing additional intel capability to support us uh, in those two components, and we definitely see a future in which we grow more cyber capability as well. So it's just impossible to think of uh, the Space Force as only the active duty force. It truly is us partnered with the Air Force Reserve today and the Air National Guard. And we see all of that uh, capability continuing to evolve as we uh, get after our space war fighting and uh, space, superior, pardon me, space superiority missions. Yeah, in the acquisition community, uh, uh, we do a lot of work with our individual mobilization augmentees. I don't know how we could perform our mission without um, uh, without those augmentees, without our reserve friends um, uh, coming to the rescue, really bringing their unique set of, uh, of skills to bear on, uh, on uh, what we need to do day in and day out. We, uh, we're relying on them on pro in program management, in engineering, in coding. Um, it's really remarkable how well integrated they are into the Space Force acquisition community, and we're uh, very much supportive of everything Stephen just articulated. Over. Yes, sir. Thank you for that. Um, so General Raymond has been, you know, in the news lately talking about de declassifying um, information to make it easier for folks to communicate to help with deterrence. Um, could we get some thoughts from both of you on on that topic? Yeah, so, um, uh, you know, here in the acquisition community, uh, everything from uh, uh, secret collateral all the way up to uh, special access programs at various security levels uh, is something that we have become, um, for lack of a better way to say it, experts at operating in that environment uh, over the many decades that we've been doing space acquisition. Uh, the chief is absolutely spot on and many other DOD leaders in 
uh, in their perspectives that um, although it is important uh, to maintain classification of our systems, uh, it can't inhibit the communication that exists between uh, program offices, weapon systems, uh, uh, ground segments, uh, things like that, that must be able to communicate with one another. Um, and so the work that the chief has been describing in public about needing to uh, declassify um, and to um, enable better integration of our warfighting force is absolutely uh, critical. There's very few details that we can share of that right now, uh, other than the uh, guarantee to those listening that we're working it really hard and uh, hope to have uh, uh, some concrete examples of it in the near future. Yeah, just building on JT's point, you know, I'm, I'm uh, reminded this is not a individual decision or what I guess in some of modern discussion will be a finite game. This is an infinite game. This is going to this is going to be the true ultra marathon. But if we do take that long view, we've made some progress. For example, one of Spock's space deltas is Delta three space electronic warfare. Uh, JT and I might have been arrested had we said those words uh, four years ago, but we can say that now uh, because we have worked through a, a rational declassification process that says, hey, electronic warfare is used in other domains. It is not, uh, it is not anything cosmic to talk about that as uh, in the space domain either. So that's the kind of process that JT is uh, alluding to. We've made progress as well uh, in our ability to share with our closest allies uh, and, and have really tightened that circle uh, with Canada, Australia, UK, uh, working towards uh, other partners as well. Um, and, and I think you'll continue to see progress. But again, it, it, we won't get to a point at which we said we've arrived. Uh, it'll continue to be that ultra long uh, infinite game that we're playing. Yeah, it's a journey, not a destination, right? Always. <laughs> so General Thompson, you uh, mentioned earlier about industry and, you know, and getting help from industry. So if both of you could speak a little bit, obviously our, our, um, a lot of the people that are on listening right now come from, from industry and, you know, the popular question is always, how can we help? Yeah. So, um, I will tell you that, um, uh, just in my four years in, uh, in my current job here as the commander of the Space and Missile Systems Center, the partnership that I have seen uh, between the U.S. government and uh, the space industrial base has simply been remarkable. Um, at a time of great change, uh, meaning, um, you know, the uh, technological change of reduced size, weight, and power available for uh, spacecraft uh, or needed for spacecraft. Uh, the tremendous amounts of change that we've seen in both the medium and heavy launch industry uh, plus the nascent small launch industry. Um, the opportunities that we have to do more common interface standards and OMS and UCI, uh, particularly in our space command and control and uh, space ground system capabilities. Um, the organizational changes that have occurred um, uh, in industry uh, here, not just in LA, but across the nation um, and within Space and Missile Systems Center uh, itself, I think uh, truly portray uh, an environment where um, the sky is the limit, or maybe the sky is not the limit, um, uh, and deep space is the limit for how we're gonna continue to collaborate with our industry partners. So I mentioned a few things from the cybersecurity perspective uh, that we need help with. Um, uh, but if I had to put one thing there is, uh, we need your good ideas, right? Uh, with the amount of investment that is going into the space industrial base on the commercial side, it is nearly impossible for the Department of Defense or space acquisition organizations to uh, invest in everything and by de facto know about everything that's going on. So what I need or what we need as a space force from all of you is rock solid communications. Uh, what are you doing that is truly game changing? What are you doing that you think might have some defense applications? What are you doing that can make the space warfighters job easier? Um, how are we prosecuting in key technology areas like 
artificial intelligence and machine learning? How are we looking at things uh, um, regarding um, uh, uh, operations in different orbits? Uh, how can we do things in proliferated LEO um, that are maybe better or more resilient than how we do things at GEO or MEO? There's a million different uh, conversations that we could have, and given the size and scope, the breadth of this audience, we could probably talk about it all day. Uh, so I'll just summarize it with, we need to hear your good ideas. We want to have dialogues. Um, these kind of events, including the one we're at right now, should not necessarily just be me and Stephen transmitting to you and then answering a few questions. These should start the dialogues between those of you in industry and not just Stephen and I, but our entire teams on those things that you think we might be able to use in our uh, little piece of the space patch, so to speak, to better defend Americans and our allies around the planet. Stephen? Well, JT, uh, you know, when we're talking about relationship with contractors, uh, I feel like you're the Jedi master and I'm just the Padawan learner here. But uh, uh, from an amateur perspective, you know, it, it dawns on me, we've learned so much, for example, in the cyber software, deli uh, software delivery arena recently with the software factories that you and your team and AFRL and others have built at Kobayashi Maru and Space Camp, where we can rapidly now develop software. That's great, but it gets cyber tested instantly as that we're building it so that we can rapidly deliver it. And, and this is starting to be so successful over the last year or two, JT, as you know, that now my op centers are getting upset when a piece of software is taking three months to field instead of six weeks to field. And think about that five years ago, that would have been unfathomable. So how do we continue to evolve those kind of processes into hardware where to use JT's terms earlier, we're not bolting on the cyber, but it's baked in from the beginning, it's getting constantly tested. And so when we get to the end, it's not a big uh, pass fail test, but we have great confidence, this is cyber secure, or, or at least at a, a cyber level of risk that we're willing to accept. And then our MDTs and CPTs can come on board to help mitigate that, that threat uh, even more. But uh, we've learned a lot in software and I think we need to move that into the hardware arena. Thank you both for that. I'm sure our industry members are, are uh, taking copious notes on all of that. So, um, General Thompson, you mentioned either that, that or they're, oh, either yeah. that or they're calling my office looking for an appointment right now. They're here probably. <laughs> Um, General Thompson, you mentioned the role of cyberspace assistance teams in assessing contractor partner networks. However, these contractors aren't normally required to share their internal cyber vulnerability information. How would you ensure cyber intel and awareness gained from contractor networks by CAT teams is shared with Blue Force cyber defenders? Yeah, so um, that's a pretty specific question. Uh, what, what I would, um, the way I would articulate my response to that would be along the lines of the CAT will work uh, with um, uh, small and medium sized vendors to um, uh, address what those small and medium sized vendors uh, would like to have addressed in terms of sharing of uh, access and, and things like that. We are, uh, we're uh, 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 very uh, clear that uh, in order to be, um, to team with the CAT, you've gotta be a volunteer. Uh, there will be non-disclosure agreements put in place and things like that. Uh, we're not uh, uh, coming in and proposing that we work with you. It's kind of the opposite way. We expect those small and medium-sized businesses to come and uh, uh, want to work with us in the capacity that they feel comfortable, okay? Um, this is something that we got a lot of feedback uh, from members of the Space Enterprise uh, Consortium, the SPEC uh, uh, other transaction agreement uh, contractual vehicle. Many of the small and medium-sized firms that are members of that consortium uh, requested help with, hey, how do we know our network is secure? What can you do to help us? And so the CAT is our, um, for lack of a better way to say it, experiment for how we might be able to help. Um, and I'm sure we will learn as we go along, as I mentioned, uh, our first uh, engagement with a, uh, with a volunteer uh, uh, just started a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and as we learn, we'll uh, grow and adjust as required to make that interaction 
as helpful to the industrial base as possible. Thank you for that, sir. So, so this morning we had uh, Miss Erin Miller, the executive director of the Space ISAC, uh, speak to us, and you know she she talked about kind of the the what Space ISAC does for the community, but but it would be great to hear both of your thoughts on on that partnership, especially given that you know we're here local to Colorado Springs and everything that that means to to U.S. Space Force. I'm sorry, I missed that presentation. And if I could, could I ask you to spell out that acronym? Acronym. I S A C, the Space ISAC. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm embarrassed by this, but I don't know what that stands for. Yeah, the Inv the Space Information Sharing and Analysis Center. Okay, I, I, and I, again, catch me a little off guard here. I think that's the facility up near the um, uh, UCCS, the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs. And, uh, you know, I, I had a chance a few years ago to, to go there, and I know that is a, uh, you know, a booming uh, operation, and General Radigy, I believe, is the executive director there. Uh, but, you know, I think that's great for Colorado Springs to, uh, to bring that capability here where we can, uh, you know, be a center of excellence for, uh, for industry and for uh, businesses and, and academia and, and private organizations to come and access that kind of expertise. Uh, you know, I think a, a nexus for Space Force will be as our, uh, as the companies that support us are, are more cyber uh, secure, certainly that will, uh, that will accrue to our benefit. As JT uh, highlighted during his remarks, um, you know, many of the, uh, the vulnerabilities that we face are because of clear defense contractors having information uh, exfiltrated and then uh, other actors now having information about our systems that we wish they wouldn't. So, uh, you know, to the extent the ISAC is, is helpful with those, uh, we look forward to, uh, to that. And then also I think there will be uh, developmental opportunities and mentoring opportunities with our cyber guardians here in the Colorado Springs area with that organization. Yeah, so um, uh, the only thing that I'll say uh, relative to the ISAC is that, um, uh, you know, just like um, in the uh, Department of Defense, where we used to account for, you know, 80 percent, 75 or 80 percent of the nation's uh, um, R&D, uh, but now that percentage is down to 20 percent. I think organizations that help us with uh, sharing of open source threat intelligence um, really uh, um, uh, don't have to be organizations actually within the Department of Defense. And so uh, organizations like the ISAC present a, uh, a, a critical set of, uh, of uh, information, if you will, data that uh, the Department of Defense and frankly, the entire interagency of the US government uh, can uh, uh, come to at least in part rely upon. Uh, so, um, you know, I know I'm speaking from, you know, a thousand miles away, uh, but things like the ISAC and uh, uh, many other uh, data sharing um, entities like we have here in the South Bay in Los Angeles is really important uh, for the nation's space enterprise. Over. Thank you both for that. Um, that was the last question. So uh, we'll, we'll give it back over to you for some, some closing thoughts. JT, would you like to go first? Um, just uh, look, um, to everybody that's participating today, I just uh, have uh, one thing to say, and, and that's really thank you. Um, uh, as you can tell um, by the testimony you see coming off of the Hill every day, as you can see uh, uh, General Raymond and uh, General Thompson uh, General Dickinson from U.S. Spacecom speaking about in the media nearly every day. Uh, the threats that the nation faces in the space domain are uh, immense and uh, uh, getting, uh, uh, not getting better. We're in a contested and a congested environment on orbit. Uh, and the fact that all, are you, all of you are here and that you're listening to us means that you care about uh, the defense of this nation, uh, our impact with our allies, uh, and with making sure that 
uh, American citizens and our allies all around the planet have the, have the best space capabilities um, available to them in support of uh, national security, but also in support of the economy and leisure and everything else associated with it. Uh, space is important. Um, and uh, I just wanna thank all of you for your attention uh, to Stephen and I today and uh, for the work, the important work uh, that you and your firms uh, or your, the, whatever entity you work for are doing in advancing um, our nation's uh, uh, space enterprise. Thanks. And I'll just echo JT's thanks. Uh, really a pleasure to be here with him. And I appreciate the uh, invite for us to speak and for everyone uh, coming up and, and listening to us. You know, I get asked frequently, what am I most excited about with US Space Force? And there's so many things. I mean, a once in a lifetime opportunity to stand up a new force. It's everything from uh, uh, recruiting. And we talked a little bit about that earlier. Uh, new, new guardians, uh, their, their whole career arc. Uh, to retiring them and one day honoring them when they get buried in a national cemetery. All of that are things that are opportunities right now. But what I'm most excited about in Spock are Delta VI and Delta VII. Delta VI bringing together uh, our cyber capability and rationalizing that and really pivoting it to be the kind of force we need to defend our mission systems, not our admin networks, but our mission systems in the cyber domain and then building toward offense I'm really excited about that opportunity. And then with Delta Seven, our ISR capabilities, um, with Delta Seven standing up, we, we brought together the Intel capabilities that were formerly in Air Force Space Command, but a lot more that used to be an Air Combat Command. And now we're bringing Title 50 Intel right down to the ops floors of our individual space missions, but also our cyber missions. And so we've really paired Intel, cyber, and space in a way that just wasn't possible prior to 20 December of 2019. And uh, really excited about where that's going to take us. And I know the systems that JT and his team acquire for us are just going to help us leapfrog that capability as we move forward. And uh, you know, excited to see what industry can do to, to help us in that journey. But again, thank you for the opportun opportunity to be here and speak today. So, General, thank you very much uh, for your time today. We appreciate that. Uh, I, General Whiting's uh, comments a little earlier reminded me of something that I hadn't, uh, I don't think I pointed out to the audience before. Uh, just kind of a, a, one of the features of this being a virtual platform. Immediately after every one of the session ends, uh, you can actually go back into your agenda and click any earlier session as an on-demand stream. So if you happen to miss a session earlier and want to catch up on it, you can do that, and we'll have those available for at least a, a couple of weeks after the, uh, the symposium closes here, uh, just in case you want to go back and see a slide or a comment or, or if you just missed a session. So that will always be available. But, Generals, again, thank you so much for your time today. I know you've got a hard stop coming up here in, in just a few minutes, and we appreciate you uh, squeezing us into your very busy schedules as you stand up our newest force and we uh, appreciate your comments and hope to have you back here uh, with us again uh, in uh, future shows hopefully in person we'll get you both on stage like you mentioned uh, in your opening comments but gentlemen thanks again and we'll be sending you on a token of appreciation one of our uh, embossed chapter notebooks uh, as a memento of your time here today so thanks again okay folks that is our last structured session uh, of today so uh, do make use of the time you've got coming up if you haven't managed to qualify for that drawing yet for the ipad uh, go grab those last couple of booths in the uh, virtual exhibit that you haven't had a chance to interact with today again you need to just interact with every one of those uh, those uh, sponsors and exhibitors there and we'll put you in that uh, that raffle and uh, hopefully i'll have a name to announce that tomorrow we'll see a few more folks that have uh, have done that uh, and similar to uh, yesterday, uh, we will at be sponsoring a, uh, we're calling it a happy hour here at uh, 1500 Mountain Time with a couple of the speakers earlier today. If you didn't manage to get one of your questions in and we didn't address it directly, or you just want to interact with them uh, in a little less uh, structured setting, please do take advantage of that session. And we'll also be announcing the winners of today's uh, Capture the Flag uh, at that time too. So lots of interesting things in that session too. A little bit more to go for today. If you can't make that, we'll see you back here tomorrow morning at uh, 0900 uh, for our first uh, keynote speaker uh, of uh, Thursday morning. So appreciate it. Uh, if I see you for happy hour, great. If not, have a good night and uh, out from the Broadmoor.